and welcome to Live Now, the info show for trends and technology. We are here in beautiful, sunny Phoenix, Arizona at the Wireless LAN Professionals Conference 2020. And it's absolutely wonderful here. We're in, it's February, but it's like 75 degrees out. People could not be happier. And we are lucky enough today to be joined by Andrew Von Naj from Salona, a brand new, fairly new company, I think, yep. there. And uh, that I wasn't too aware of until about uh, eight months or a year or so ago. I saw my first thing about Salona. First of all, Andrew, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you for having me. I know that Salona plays in the, uh, it's the uh, CBRS space. Mm -hmm. This was a term that I was not really familiar with until uh, I think a tech field day where we saw this on there. For right. anyone else who isn't familiar with CBRS, why don't you give us the quick rundown on, on what CBRS is and what Salona does? Yeah, absolutely. So CBRS stands for Citizens Broadband Radio Service. So it's a- So it's like CB? Like Breaker One Nine? No, no. It, it's despite kind of the name, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, two-way radio type of functionality. Ah. It's new spectrum band in, in the 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz range that was opened up uh, just late last year by the FCC and full commercial availability starting this year, just uh, this last month in January of 2020. And what it is is it's a, a new spectrum band for mobile broadband services, meaning LTE and 5G. And one of the big uh, aspects of it is that uh, it's not licensed spectrum. And it's also not unlicensed spectrum either. It's a hybrid in between what they call shared spectrum. And this allows enterprises potentially to deploy cellular networks uh, that they own and control as opposed to the traditional cellular networks deployed by carriers and mobile network operators. So does this kind of do for cell networks what 2.4 gig originally did for Wi-Fi where all of a sudden anyone can do 2.4 gig, anyone can can you know bring out a router and all of a sudden there's an explosion of 2.4 gig wired data devices. Right, when the FCC opened up 2.4 gigahertz, I mean it created, created like this explosion of right. innovation in unlicensed spectrum. And CBRS with the shared spectrum model is actually termed or coined by the FCC the innovation band. The FCC is trying to replicate what it's been able to do and the success it's had with other spectrum initiatives of opening it up for broader use cases to enable the market to go and innovate and develop solutions that really solve uh, today's needs. So uh, we're here at the Wireless LAN Professionals Conference in, in Phoenix. Uh, most of the people here, I get the impression, are Wi-Fi people. They're not necessarily LTE or carrier people. Mm -hmm. uh, even though wireless does encompass both of those, it's, it's, it's a Wi-Fi conference. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. This, this is really a Wi-Fi conference for Wi-Fi professionals. Right. So what would you say are maybe the top three things that a Wi-Fi professional or a wireless installer needs to know about this this new band that's coming up. Yeah, what I would say is, uh, you know, the first thing that Wi-Fi professionals should know is that uh, this new spectrum with CBRS is a shared spectrum model and it really is a hybrid between licensed and unlicensed technology. So it really provides the opportunity for clean spectrum that is only lightly used by incumbents today, mainly um, Federal Navy radar off the coast and a few fixed satellite service companies. But by and large, it's unused across most of the, the land mass of the US. So it, it offers an avenue for enterprises to deploy their own private LTE networks uh, that they fully own and control. Uh, they can integrate seamlessly with their existing network infrastructure to provide you know, a cost-effective uh, means of adoption for this new technology and it re really leverage it to solve uh, business challenges uh, that they've, they've had and potentially weren't able to solve or new business uh, you know, initiatives that they're looking at uh, extending into. Right, and I, I know there was, I think I saw there was a decision just like in January about opening up some of this space. We're only in mid-February now. What, what went on in January then? Yeah, so January was the culmination of about several years worth of work from the FCC and uh, the, the business alliances with the Wind Forum that does standard specification for CBRS and the CBRS Alliance, which is more the, the marketing um, commercialization aspect. And so the, the process culminated in January of 2020 with full commercial availability of the spectrum because it had been in what they called an initial commercial deployment, which is just test and evaluation to see how it goes, to test the new systems and the new um, protocols and components that go into managing this shared spectrum between different uh, parties being incumbents with like the Federal Navy and D 
Department of Defense that need to be protected when they are using the spectrum. Uh, there's going to be a priority access license for folks to actually get priority access to some slices of the spectrum. And then there's going to be general authorized access, which is the third tier, which is really anybody can use it as long as they meet uh, the FCC's rules. So general access, you don't even have to apply for that. You, yeah. don't, you don't need, there's no, you know, you don't need a, a grant of any kind from the FCC or the standards body. You can literally just build a device and, and market it? Correct. So manufacturers like the company I'm at with Solona, we manufacture manufacturer network infrastructure and there are other you know uh, manufacturers in the, in this industry right manufacturer equipment and the software and protocols to integrate uh, with what they call spectrum access system uh, vendors and there's five large vendors that maintain a database on the back end of who's using what spectrum where and essentially as long as you pass FCC certification and meet the rules and integrate with these SAS vendors um, you can deploy a private LTE network in CBRS band and comply with all the federal rules. So you don't have to pay for licensed spectrum. All you have to do is uh, you know, buy a private network that you deploy and control yourself. Wow, and so is Solona one of the priority tier levels? Or I, I, I assume the incumbents, you talk about like the Navy, uh, which does that mean if you happen to be near an air base of some kind, you know, there's circles of areas where these can't be used? Yeah, so tier one with the incumbents is really, it's mainly around uh, 17 shipborne radar systems, mainly on aircraft carriers. And they move? They move. So they are in the oceans, they come potentially along the coast, and there's three main sites that are potentially impacted the most. Right. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, San Diego, and Seattle, where there's large obviously um, Navy bases. And uh, forgive my ignorance, uh, if somebody near there wanted to install a, a, a system like this, yeah. would you recommend them against it or is it? No, uh, it's just a matter of planning and design. They can still deploy a CBRS network. Uh, the spectrum band itself is 150 megahertz wide. Um, it's anticipated that any aircraft carrier will only use a very small slice of that spectrum. And so when the when they come into the, the port or, or the, the naval base and potentially radios in that area are impacted, they just need to uh, not operate on the same like five megahertz small section that that aircraft carrier is using. I but see. they can use the rest of the band. Oh, okay. So I know you gave a big training uh, yesterday, a big mm -hmm. uh, deep dive as, as it's called here at uh, the Wireless LAN conference, which is probably good because again, I, I'm sure a lot of these people, this yeah. is something that's fairly new to them. What would you say are the big takeaways from your training? And first of all, uh, that I know everything here has been recorded. Are you guys going to make the training public as well? Yeah, I believe we're going to ma be making the training public. There's a huge demand. I think the big takeaway, the biggest takeaway for me from the, the training session we had here was there's a large amount of uh, high level of engagement from all these Wi-Fi professionals. They understand that uh, wireless in the enterprise environment is expanding beyond just Wi-Fi. Mm. And, and this really um, provides uh, a lot of potential, and they're eager, eager to learn about LTE and 5G and its applications to enterprises and to get ahead of the curve. Um, the other thing is that spectrum sharing is, is new and the mechanics of SaaS integration and operation, um, we're still very much in the early days. So all of this has been defined. The FCC has tested it to their liking. Now we're starting to see commercial deployments and we'll continue to deploy and learn from those to you know, refine exactly um, how enterprises need to deploy this, this technology. And then I would say the last takeaway from the training session is that uh, LTE is new to a lot of people. It's no longer confined to just engineers in the carrier and mobile network operator space. Um, so it's becoming approachable to a much wider audience. Like traditionally, like most of these folks are you know, familiar with Wi-Fi, it's been very uh, approachable as a consumer technology. Right. Cellular, people are familiar with it from, you know. I mean, a, they use it. Fr from a consumer yeah. handset perspective. Right. But nobody, nobody on, except for carriers has deployed these networks. So it's very new. And so there'll be high demand for training and training content uh, and certification for these engineers to learn about these technologies uh, with LTE and 5G and to be able to design and deploy these networks because it's commercially available today and these networks are coming. So let's talk about that then. Obviously there's a ton of Wi-Fi hardware out there, there's a ton of LTE hardware. What sort of hardware do you need to use this? Is it, and, and I'm gonna take a leap here, I'm, again, fairly ignorant to these sort of things, yeah. but I assume the, the easiest thing to do is to bridge it. So, you know, you've got this, you know, your network, mm -hmm. your CBRE network, you have some sort of bridge over to Wi-Fi and then you use the Wi-Fi and, you know, and backhaul it on the, on the CBRE network. But 
without that, do you need some CBRE like native devices? Yeah, so... Um, or do all LTE devices talk on CBRE? So the great thing about uh, CBRS as a spectrum CBRS, band... CBRS, excuse Yeah, me. no worries. CBRS as a spectrum band is just another band defined by the 3GPP, which is the standards body for LTE. And so every LTE chipset that ships from Qualcomm uh, starting late last year actually includes support for C the CBRS Spectrum Band. So if you've got an iPhone 11, it can do CBRS. Yeah, so there's already, there's already devices, a, a pretty robust ecosystem, and it's only gonna grow larger. We've already got iPhone 11s, uh, Google Pixel 3 and 4s, Samsung S10s, Note 10s, well, a large amount of tablets and um, like cradle point routers and gateways and Sierra bridges and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, devices in the ecosystem already, but over the next 12 months, we'll see it just uh, a flood of those devices. Because every device that comes out and supports uh, LTE will support CBRS natively. And so the access um, onto the network will be end user devices or business solution embedded devices connecting directly to a CBRS network. No bridge over to Wi-Fi or anything like that. Hmm. It's just gonna be a complementary network to solve different use cases in the enterprise that are maybe potentially more mission critical and have higher uh, SLA requirements for predictable performance. So probably not like an IoT play. Uh, IoT is actually one of the large applications for LTE and 5G. Oh, okay. Yeah, so very low power devices or low data bandwidth devices, but they're very critical that they get their communications through. And the other aspect to IoT is just uh, the device, de de uh, excuse me, the device density. So there's a large amount of devices, sensors for smart buildings or, or things of that nature, uh, in universities for pre precision agriculture and things like that for research. Um, the amount of sensors that are potentially going to be deployed um, are just thousands potentially of devices per square kilometer. So people are looking for solutions like LTE that can handle that device density. I'm just thinking about devices that traditionally don't have 4G or LTE access mm -hmm. but do have Wi-Fi access mm -hmm. like Printers, for yeah. for example, uh, you know things like that. Um, maybe some sort of you know servers or what have you that you that you need. Even laptops today, I think it's a minority that would have an LTE chip inside them. Yeah, I think right now you do definitely see a you know a divided market of Wi-Fi only devices and devices that are geared toward LTE. Right. I think you know just like anything else, we're going to see a blending of the two. Really, LTE um, has been about portability. The smaller the device more likely it has an LTE chip, like an iPad or a phone is likely to have 4G or something, but a larger laptop or, as I say, a printer, something that doesn't, isn't mobile, right? generally they just stick Wi-Fi. Yeah, I think it's been you know, two things about economics of the two different markets. Right. Because um, you know, traditional carriers, you have to have a data plan and it's a subscription-based service, whereas Wi-Fi is you can deploy it yourself and there's no kind of ongoing subscription cost. Once you've deployed it, you can uh, leverage it for private business use. And so now that we see, I think, use cases coming in for uh, private LTE in an enterprise setting, uh, the device ecosystem is starting to uh, merge that a lot of these devices that have traditionally been Wi-Fi only, we're going to see um, bundled with LTE and, and cellular chipsets for the private networks. And then the cost of LTE has come down quite a bit as well. It used to be LTE chipsets uh, were quite a price premium just to embed in the devices themselves. So hmm. the price of the device would be much higher, potentially, if you embedded LTE in it. Um, those chipset costs have come down. They're not to the same price point as Wi-Fi chipsets at this point, but they're much more comparable. So we're going to see the, the market economics change so that those uh, devices are going to proliferate with LTE. Now, two places where I know uh, people complain a lot about 4G current or you know even mm -hmm. current LTE access are things like uh, indoors in buildings where sometimes uh, you know you can't get good cell access and also at large venues and stadiums and such where perhaps the 4G mm -hmm. band is saturated. Are, are either of those two cases a good use case for something like this? Yeah, depending on the application. So indoors definitely because there is a, a large potential gap in macro carrier coverage indoors for cellular. Um, and so uh, there are opportunities for what we call neutral host or roaming agreements with carriers to augment their networks by deploying private networks indoors owned and operated by an enterprise or a managed service provider and selling access to that indoor uh, network back to the carrier so they can augment their coverage. Just like today, uh, carriers go into certain locations and put in uh, DAS systems for their own networks, but it, it costs a lot of money. So potentially this is one avenue uh, to, to explore for indoors. For outdoors, um, like stadiums and things like that, 
some of those use cases could be back office type applications, maybe not the fan direct access that might stay on carrier or, or Wi-Fi, um, but for point of sale and ticket scanners and those back office uh, type of applications in those environments where they want to get it away potentially from the congestion on the Wi-Fi or on the public's uh, cellular network, those would be great uh, use cases. Hmm. So for engineers who are watching this or people who are you know in the field, how would you say people should best go out and maybe educate themselves a little bit more? Where, where can we send people? Yeah, starting points to learn about CBRS and LTE. I think on the CBRS side, uh, you start with the, the organizations that are leading the charge on, on developing those solutions. So that's the win forum. The, on their website, there's a large amount of resources on the standards that they're developing for the spectrum and how that works. Uh, the other one is the CBRS Alliance, which I mentioned earlier. They're more the commercialization arm. They're the business alliance uh, developing business use cases and how the technology can be used. And they're also the ones leading the charge on adapting the LTE standards into this new spectrum band because some of the use cases are fairly unique and they need some extension or uh, changes to LTE in order to make that uh, work for the new business use cases. Um, for LTE, it's a little bit uh, different. Um, there are some good introductory materials that are free out there on the on the internet, such as um, one I would recommend is uh, an Alcatel Lucent white paper on LTE network architecture. It's a great introductory white paper. Um, a little light reading. A little light reading. It's definitely not as deep as most of the you know standard specifications. So <laughs> it's it's approachable. Right. Let's say um, other options are really in print material. There's a lot of books available for purchase um, that include like. LTE and Bullets is a good book. Uh, EPC and 4G Packet Networks is a good introductory book. And finally, I'd say on uh, the analyst side, there's a good assessment of the private LTE market um, and value proposition by Dean Bubbly from Disruptive Analysis. Hmm. He actually partnered with uh, one of the software solution providers in the space, IB Wave, and they published an ebook uh, around private LTE. So definitely go check that out on IB Wave's site. Fantastic. So. Lastly, uh, let's wrap this up. I want to talk a little bit about you. Yeah. Uh, I met you years and years ago. Uh, I think you were about 12 uh, at Aerohive, uh, which was sort of a startup at the time and then grew, went public, uh, and uh, then ended up getting bought out uh, by Extreme. Um, and now you're with Solona, which is like another startup, I guess. Yeah, are, yeah. You a, are you a startup-aholic? Uh, well, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm not definitely deep into the startup culture, but I do like exciting new challenges and building you know, new solutions that solve problems. So um, that happened for me back in the day with Aerohive and with uh, the Wi-Fi community and, and, and solutions out there. Uh, I took a break from that, actually, for a few years uh, for personal reasons as I grew my family and things like that. Um, and now I'm at a point where um, I thought the timing was right with the market transition into private LTE in the enterprise. Um, I, I think it really has potential and I'm, I'm just happy as, as I could be uh, with Salona and, and helping drive this market forward. Andrew Vonage, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. It's always fascinating seeing where you've gone and the new things that you're involved yeah, with. Yeah, could I add one thing? I mean, yeah, Salona, please. we're announcing our online community as well here in the next uh, oh, week or two. wonderful. And we would like everybody to go out and make sure that uh, if you're looking for training, you're looking for content, we're going to be having a lot of avenues to get private LTE and CBRS content out into the market. Okay. Blogs, podcasts, videos, um, things of that nature. So sign up for our newsletter on our website on Salona.io. Um, on our newsletter, it comes out once a month. You won't get spammed, but we will keep you informed on um, when that community launches, as well as uh, information on when we post things. Right, so. and this video will be rebroadcast uh, as a podcast for Wireless Land Professionals, and of course, it'll be up on the Salona website as well, so it's a great resource for getting started for yeah. someone like myself, who really is a neophyte when it comes to this, uh, this new segment. We're all neophytes in the beginning. Right. You've got you to learn somewhere. And with that, I will say thank you so much. We've got a lot more uh, coming up from Wireless Land Professionals after this, so please stay tuned, and we'll see you in just a few minutes right here on Live Now.